All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Daryl Harper, and I'm the director of the Center for Humanistic Inquiry. This is part of a set of common experiences that we um, uh, we've designed for for all of you who are in your first year, and this will be one of your your. Uh, early experiences when you get here. And we thought it'd be a good idea if we had a conversation and you could hear about how these research fellows uh, have come into their fields and into their questions and, and what holds them, what uh, sets them on fire about uh, the work that they do. So I'm gonna ask each of you, maybe starting with Ashley, to go around and uh, just tell us your name, your department or program that you're appointed to here in Amherst College, and then uh, a little bit about your topic or your, your the project that you're pursuing as a Chief Fellow. Welcome. My name is Ashley Sandoval. I'm the Chief Fellow that's um, stationed in American Studies, and the book project that I'll be working on while at the Chi is titled Designing Reconciliation, Race, and the Performance of Architecture. It brings together fields that aren't often thought together, such as critical race theory, performance studies, and architectural theory, to understand how design manages racial inequity, specifically how design and architecture is used to post solutions to racial inequity through stage scenes of racial reconciliation. And the book follows uh, 21st century design discourse through tiny house villages, color psychology discourse, prison renovations, border designs, and municipal transportation initiatives. And it's trying to understand the mechanisms by which architecture stages racial fantasies. And it's also trying to look into why design seems like it's capable of attending to racial inequities, but it often forecloses some of those possibilities. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, Trent? Thank you, Daryl. I'm the Chief Fellow in the English Department at Amherst. And uh, my book project is called Afro-Ethnic Renewal. And it's a forthcoming, my forthcoming book and first book and it's under contract with the University of North Carolina Press. And what I do, what it does is that it intervenes in African American, Latino American, and life writing studies. And so the project that I'm working on tries to open the border between the canons of Latino and African American literature by centering this long but often neglected history of African American literary, cultural, and political influences in Latino life writing and autobiography. And like more specifically, uh, I explore African-American narrative strategies, cultural tropes, and political genealogies in Afro-Latino memoirs. And I study how these influences shape what uh, scholars in my field call triple consciousness. So Afro-Latinos' conceptions of ethnic, national, and racial identity formation, and how they change over time from the New Negro Renaissance, you know, 1920s, 1930s, to what we call now the post-Soul era. So after 1973 until 2000 or roughly into the present. And the big argument that I'm trying to make here is that Afro-Latino writers use these uh, African-American influences to assert and authenticate their sense of national and diasporic belonging. So in other words, they use these influences to write themselves into the archive of US literary history in ways that expand and complicate not only what it means to be and become Latino, um, but also what it means to be and become African-American. Thanks, Trent. Uh, Rose. Hi, everyone. My name is Rose Lenahan. Um, I'll be a fellow in the Department of Philosophy as well as the Chi Center. Um, I'm working on two projects right now. So one is in social philosophy, and I'm trying to think about the historian Barbara Fields' Metaphysics of Race. And um, this is connected to broader questions in social philosophy about what it means for um, identity categories and social categories to be socially constructed and what that means for how they can figure in explanations and social explanations um, and other kinds of causal explanations. And then um, my other project, which is um, bigger and a little bit scarier, is uh, thinking about um, Marxist theories of race and racism and the idea that racism and racial hierarchy are functional for capitalism and capital accumulation. So thinking about um, you know, why it might be that we see racism and racial hierarchy re recurring in um, so many different uh, kinds of capitalism and across different stages of capitalist development. Thanks. Uh, Janice. Hey, everyone. Um, I will be hosted by the Department of Art and History of Art while I'm at 
Amherst. Um, and my project is entitled Partial Selves Whole Bodies uh, for now. And it looks specifically to photographs of anti-Black violence in the 19th and 20th centuries um, and asks how those photographs were utilized to develop our con uh, concepts of humanity as well as citizenry, two concepts which were really interlinked um, during that time. And then I definitely will be touching on how the legacies that have been formed through those photographs continue to present themselves in contemporary images of racial violence, such as in the recordings of police brutality that are becoming um, increasingly prevalent and um, are continuing to circulate at an ever rapid speed. Thanks, Janice. And uh, Watufani. Hi everyone, um, welcome to Amherst. Uh, my name is Watufani Poe. I'm going to be housed in the departments of Black Studies in the program of Latinx and Latin American Studies. And the project that I'm going to be working on, continuing working on um, while at Amherst um, is my book project entitled Resisting Fragmentation, The Radical Possibilities of Black LGBTQ Activism in Brazil and the United States. Um, and like the title suggests, my project really looks at uh, Black LGBTQ activism in both countries to understand how the intersectional identities of Black LGBTQ folks informs the kind of social and political movements they become involved with and how they're imagining questions of Black queer and trans freedom. Um, and so some of the work that I'm going to be engaging with at Amherst is working on a new chapter, which takes up the question of the moment of 2020 and looking at the Black uprisings that have taken place in both countries to understand how the leadership of Black, queer, and trans folks shifts the kind of activist conversations that are happening within both countries in this, um, in this moment of uprising. Thanks, Watufani. Let me go right to, uh, starting with you, Janice. Um, how did you get into this work? And specifically, how do you negotiate your own identity uh, and kind of things that were important to you, say maybe when you were at the stage of our first year students and, and then end up in where you are now, you know, doing, doing the kind of uh, work that you're doing? Yeah, um, so I actually have my uh, bachelor's degree in painting. And so I was a painter and started in the visual arts world. So that's kind of where my primary interest lies. And so, um, and when I was in college, I always was dealing with issues of race um, and post-coloniality at the time. Um, and then I think as I progressed and transitioned into the academic world, I just felt like um, I needed to get a bit more back to the fundamentals. So asking the basics of why we utilize imagery at all to think about race and how does something so ephemeral like a painting maybe or a photograph um, influence the material acts that um, and perceptions and understandings that we have of each other. How does something that's visual come to have such a strong impact on the way we live our lives. And so that's kind of the ground floor of where I started to think about these issues. And um, my dissertation was actually focused on racial violence largely, not specifically on anti-Black violence. But I think as I began to transition to this stage of my career and reckoning with the things that were happening across the country, across the world, especially this past spring, um, I realized that this was the most urgent thing for me to tend to. And also because I, I think like many others, we're trying to figure out how to develop, how to think of a language to talk about these really um, complicated and upsetting moments, these images that were really determining how we perceive um, race. And uh, so, yeah, that's how I came to this specific project at the moment. Um, and so I'm hoping it'll eventually lend to um, a way of thinking about how um, the current circumstances of the images that are circulating are really grounded in a much longer history um, in our country. Okay. Thanks. I, I want to ask. Uh, it's a really helpful answer, and I I, um, I want to go to Rose next, and I ask you the same question, um, and I want to point out for all the first years that 
uh, Rose, you are an alumna of Amherst College, um, so you have a, a very intimate connection with the with the institution. Um, so interested to hear your your reflections for that uh, part as well. And then maybe if you would also add another layer, um, do you how do you feel that scholarship? Um, kind of contributes to the issues that, that Janice was bringing up. Does scholarship have an important role to play for you? So, right. I was an undergraduate at Amherst. Um, I was a philosophy major. I was class of 2011. And um, I was not politicized when I was an Amherst undergraduate, and I was not um, very aware of the um, history of racial injustice in this country or the world. Um, I, um, I, one of my major regrets now is that I didn't take any classes in the Black Studies Department at Amherst because it's a really, really great department with really amazing faculty members, as I learned later <laughs> when I was, um, when I changed topics. So um, I started graduate school in philosophy and um, about midway through, I took a year off and I, I was, um, I was very upset politically <laughs> and I felt like um, the distance between the academy and what was happening in the world was too big. And, um, and when I came back, I decided to come back, but I totally changed topics. And I um, was beginning to focus on reparations. And I was really interested in um, philosophical arguments for reparations. Um, and there are, there's, a, there's a pretty large literature in philosophy on um, on different kinds of reparations arguments and um, in different justifications and different different understandings of what reparations might look like or might require um, and how that fits into other questions in political philosophy and moral philosophy. Um, and so it was through that thinking, thinking about reparations and then thinking about um, the connections to uh, all the present injustices in the world. So not just atoning for past injustices or trying to repair past injustices, but um, the enormous injustices that are ongoing and the, the institutional changes that need to happen um, in the present. That really led me on the path I'm, I'm at now. And um, I mean, I think as Janice sort of, I mean, there's, there's, there's so much more than, than scholarship for these questions. And I think, especially when we're talking about um, you know, ongoing racial violence, um, the, the emotional aspect and the, um, the kind of uh, social intelligence and emotional intelligence are, and the ability to communicate openly with people and to be willing to, you know, realize how much you don't know. And um, all of that is, is so important. But I think for me, the scholarship is so important because it's very easy to make these questions seem very simple and to um, give sort of like pat, pat answers to these questions or, you know, sometimes the, the ideas that are present in popular culture, I think are, if you think a little bit harder about them, they're not very satisfying. Um, and so for me, uh, academic work and, and scholarly work is, is important for that reason, to kind of complicate the, the received ideas that we have about some of these topics. Thanks. Um, Watufani, uh, your response? Yeah, I mean, I, I resonated with a lot of what Rose was saying um, in terms of thinking about this, this disconnect between the academy um, and the and the world, like what's happening outside of the academy's walls. I think when I was an undergrad, I felt a lot of those those tensions as well. I mean, I come from an activist family. My parents are, are were pan Africanist organizers, and so I came up in a kind of mindset of one of my core one of my core thinkings is how can we make the world better. Um, and I think that that's what originally drove me to the kind of college that I went to. I went to Swarthmore for undergrad. And, um, and, I, and I felt like there were exciting conversations in terms of helping me understand who I am in relationship to the world. Um, but 
I felt really bogged down by the, the distance, um, the distance between the kinds of questions that we were talking about, the kinds of political um, urgencies that we were talking about in class and not knowing what to do about them. Um, in the kind of practice. And so that ended, that led me to, to, to spend a year abroad, um, a semester in the Dominican Republic and a semester in Brazil. And this was really to kind of tend to those questions of Pan-Africanism and understanding that I had a, whole, a wealth of knowledge about the Pan-African world, um, it, it, English speaking, the French speaking Pan-African world, um, but I had a, a dearth of knowledge about uh, the, 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 Afro, uh, the, the African diaspora within Latin America. So I really wanted to, to see this up close, to, to kind of get out of the academy's walls, to be able to experience, live in community with people. Um, and, I, and that really brought me to the kinds of questions that I, that I ended up studying for my dissertation project. Um, I, I was not expecting to see a kind of rich and vibrant um, Black queer activism like I saw when I was in Brazil. Um, and in the kinds of urgent questions that were happening, the kinds of pushes against violence towards um, LGBTQ communities in their large part Black LGBTQ uh, communities, um, the ways in which I saw people finding finding ways to express joy even amongst the violence, um, finding, finding beautiful kinds of, of, of enclaves of community space, um, even in the midst of danger um, and violence. Um, and I think that that really showed me that there's so much for the whole world, not just Black queer communities and diaspora, but the whole world to understand from the experiences of Black LGBTQ folks and their experiences of yearning, pushing for freedom, that there is something there um, that will help us to understand what it is we need to do as a society. So this question of, Black queer freedom, it is incredibly relevant for Black queer and trans communities, but it's also incredibly relevant for everyone outside of those communities to understand how it is that we can, we can um, make a new world. Thanks. Um, Ashley, let me throw the question to you and, and maybe add uh, this uh, complicating layer of uh, the, one of the things that, that I worry about for our first year students and, and students in general and even all of us, and I wonder how you deal with this, um, Rose mentioned it, that when you're working with these kinds of questions, and this is your job, this is like, I get up in the morning, I deal with these questions all day, I write about them, I think about them, I talk about them. And then tomorrow I do the same thing next week and next month and next year. Um, what, what happens with, do you, do you feel fatigue? Do you have strategies for dealing with it? What, what do we say to our first year students who say, oh my God, I'm so tired of talking about this. It's, you know, I, I have to do something else. What, how, do, how do you navigate that part of this, um, this work? Thanks. Um, so for the first part, and then I'll, I'll push the second part, sort of strategies of staying in the work. I think a core interest of mine that sort of developed throughout my life is trying to understand how our existences are structured out of one another's oppression, and more specifically, how we might undo that. So I think as a light-skinned person of color, sort of the question of race has been an early one. It's sort of born out of noticing the discrepancies between how my body and the bodies of my family members were treated as we moved from space to space, and also noticing how the resources in the built environment differed. Uh, vastly between the spaces where brown and black people lived and the spaces where middle and upper class white families lived. And I, I took, uh, for my undergraduate, I majored in um, political science and Japanese. And at that time, I started to think about just theories of power and oppression. And then I, I got an MA in women's gender and sexual race studies. And then I moved into performance studies. Um, and in that department, I started looking at sort of architecture and design and how it was supposed to be used to address social inequality. At the level of the dissertation, that's sort of what I was doing. Um, and I started to notice, I started to ask myself, why is design and architecture so seductive? Uh, why does it seem like it's, it's capable of doing all these things? And I started to see what it was supposed to be uh, staging or, and I noticed how race uh, impacted uh, evolutions in design and perpetuations of design and even our attachments to it. Um, so that's sort of how I got to the project, um, but how to stay in something that, that's really sort of long-term um, I have morning and evening routines. <laughs> so I have morning routines where I, I wake up and I do something nice for myself. 
Um, you know, it starts off with coffee or a smoothie, uh, meditation likely, uh, reading that just is, is fun for myself so that every morning I know before I get to the work, there's something to enjoy. I give myself rewards throughout the work. So if I've written, you know, my two hours for that block, then I go out and take a walk with uh, the cats. So my partner and I have two cats that we take on walks, so we do that. And then at night I have an evening routine where I do a facial <laughs> and I do some, I practice self care. Um, so I think having sort of those routines where I know throughout the day, there's going to be really fun moments, no matter what, even if the work is challenging. Uh, and then sometimes the work is really rewarding. And then I also schedule in times to talk to, to friends and other colleagues that bring me joy. Um, so that I know that I can, if I'm having a tough day, I can talk it out. Or if I'm having a great idea, I have someone to, to think through it with. Um, so I think it's important to sort of develop those those self care routines for yourself and know that that uh, it's not it's not selfish or it's not unimportant. It's really important. It's sustaining, uh, and it's important to develop and find people that that bring you joy. Oh, thanks, and uh, Trent. Um, so I've I've thrown a, a few prompts in this last round. Um, any responses to to any of them you'd like to share? Sure. Thank you, Daryl. I would think uh, my journey is a little bit different. Um, I started out as an undergraduate in computer science. And so I think I want to stress the importance of not being afraid to change. Um, I finished that degree, but I realized after I went into the industry a year after undergrad that this was not, you know, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And what I really enjoyed uh, was literature. And so when I went back and I got my master's in English, I got an MFA in creative writing. Um, I, that's what I focused on. And I did that uh, master's at uh, Texas A&M and the MFA at Emerson College. And then went on and then had a, a career in um, higher education in the two, in the community college sector uh, until I resigned from that. And, but along before resigning from that, you know, decided to pursue a PhD in Afro-American studies where I finished at uh, UMass Amherst. And the way that I got to it was after teaching um, creative writing and, um, you know, first year writing for several years and discovering in my class that, you know, students were consistently asking, you know, more and more about these questions about, um, you know, race, class, gender, and sexuality in my creative writing classes, in my composition studies classes. And I wanted to um, speak on those issues with more credibility and authority than I had with my training as a creative writer. So, you know, I decided in 2011 uh, or entered the, um, entered the PhD program at UMass Amherst in 2011 and finished in 2017. And so that's how I came to bring, you know, my personal experience and my training as a creative writer, you know, to this new study, my new discipline in Afro-American Afro -American studies, where I study African-American literature and Latino literature from 1865 to the present. And I specifically focus on the Afro-Latino memoir because I was looking for narratives in literary history, in literary culture that counter these popular narratives of Latino and African-American enmity. Because I knew they were there from my own personal experience. Like when, again, when I was back in computer science as an undergrad and we did these internships at um, these, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, tele I guess telephony companies are what they called them back in the day. Um, and so they were interning, you know, with people from University of Mayaguez, other students from um, Puerto Rico. And so I know from my personal experience that this, these popular narratives of this enmity weren't true. And so I wanted to trace those histories of the African-American influences and how they inform Afro-Latino memoir writing and coming of age stories, you know, um, these influences from the Black Arts Movement or even going back to the Harlem Renaissance. Or what I talked about earlier, we talked about the post soul era, which is basically the hip hop generation to the present. And so that's where the, that question is what I was trying to answer and looking at it through that, through that lens and those histories or what brought me to that particular project um, at UMass Amherst and what I'm working on today. Oh, thanks. This has been a, a really wonderful conversation for, for me to participate in. I mean, this is, it feels like such a privilege to hear from all of you about your work in this way and I'm glad that the first years um, have compelled us to come together in this way normally we would do something oh, it would stretch over a couple weeks and it would you know three of us would have a conversation one week and two of us another week and 
This is the first time we've ever done this, and it, it's because of the first years that we thought, oh, you know, maybe we'll all come together uh, and have this conversation. But it, hearing some of the overlaps and intersections, uh, just so uh, fascinating. I'm really looking forward to working with all of you. Um, before we wrap up, let me uh, invite you uh, to just offer an, any words of, of uh, advice or uh, any thoughts uh, that you want to share with the first year students, um, you know, any, any kind of final uh, things that come to mind. Um, maybe uh, start with Ashley again. Welcome, and, and uh, please take this time to enjoy all the things that you want to be curious about. Uh, feel free to explore and do the things you didn't think you could have time for. Um, I, th I think undergrad is a perfect time for exploring and, and finding things that you enjoy. Thanks. Janice? I actually wanted to reiterate what Ashley said earlier about self-care. I think the earlier you can implement that kind of practice, the smoother the whole ride will be. And um, I think for many of us in later generations, it's not something we probably learn to do till maybe too late. So I encourage you to take care of yourself, be kind to yourself, enjoy what you're doing um, while you're here. What too funny? Yeah, I, I want to reiterate what, what Trent said earlier about the importance of not being afraid to, to shift directions. Um, I think that that's something that understandably brings a lot of fear. Um, but I think that undergrad is a great place to think about if you are not invested in something or you want to try something else, don't be afraid to, to shift directions. Um, and also get to know your professors. Um, I think some a lot of us come from high school um, environments where where getting to know your professors or talking to your professors about what you're interested in, um, seeking mentorship is not as, as regular as it should be. Um, and so I think that at a, sm at a small liberal arts environment like Amherst, definitely take advantage, get to know your, your, your professors, find good mentors. Uh, Trent? So I guess I would add to some of the things that have already been said about um, self-care. Um, you know, find, make those rituals, make those routines. Um, the time will go by fast. Um, I know that everyone here is a high achievers, and so you're very concerned about grades. But, you know, have a physical social network where you go out and do things socially together, you know, with the constraints, you know, the pandemic in mind, of course. But that, that's important, I mean, to, uh, to get out and have that physical connection and, you know, getting to know people. And don't be afraid to reach out um, to any of us, um, you know, to me as well, particularly the, those students who may, you know, be in the hard sciences, like I started out, you know, in the hard sciences, but you want to, you know, exercise those literary uh, analysis muscles or those critical theory muscles, just, you know, come reach out and uh, take a class, you know, happy to talk to you about your interests, about culture, history and politics. Um, and it's not just, we don't want the disciplines to be, you know, bound off in silos. And so um, reach out if, uh, if you ever want to. Thanks. And Rose? Welcome. Um, I guess when I think about the fall of my freshman year, I remember um, a little bit of a feeling of terror. So I just want to uh, let you guys know that, um, that, you know, it's really hard. It's college is really hard at first and it's hard to make the adjustment and it's hard to feel like, especially if you're coming from really far away or, you know, a really different place, it's hard to feel like, you know, you have to start, start fresh. And, um, and I remember that and just know that, um, you know, this is an amazing blessing and um, the the resources of this institution and the the library alone I mean the like there's a lot of wonderful stuff awaits you um, and and I guess I would also um, you know a regret I have is is kind of being um, not being as sort of socially expansive as I wish I had been or something I mean there's people from from all over the world who are going to be at Amherst and people with totally different backgrounds and totally different experiences. And especially when you're coming somewhere for the first time, it's very easy to stick, you know, stick to the people who feel most familiar to you or who are most similar to where you're coming from. And, um, and I would encourage you not to do that because there's so, 
so so much. Um, so welcome. Thanks. And speaking of the library, we are located in Frost Library on the second floor, the Center for Humanistic Inquiry. That's where uh, all of us have offices and, uh, and you can find us there. And uh, we wish you uh, all the best for your, your first semester and beyond uh, at, at Amherst and look forward to seeing you in person soon. Thanks.